Let's continue interpreting, look again by Sharat and Sunstein. Previously, we discussed the various rules of habituation, which have both benefits and drawbacks. Today, let's talk about the advantages of discomfort and dehabituation. Let's start with a case study. I'm puzzled as to why I only learned about this case when reading this book. This is undoubtedly a famous case that should be frequently discussed. I'm sure you won't forget it once you hear it. We know that, due to historical path dependency, some countries drive on the right side of the road while others drive on the left. This is inconvenient. For better visibility of surrounding vehicles, it's best if the driver and steering wheel are on the side closest to oncoming traffic. This means left-hand drive cars for right-side driving and right-hand drive cars for left-side driving. This not only means each car brand has to produce two types of cars, but also special measures are needed when moving from left-side driving regions like Hong Kong to right-side driving regions like mainland China. What's the difference between left and right? Why not unify and have all countries drive on the right side? Of course, the cost of such a change is too high. But such a change has indeed happened before. Sweden used to drive on the left, but neighboring countries like Norway, Finland, and Denmark all drove on the right, making cross-border driving inconvenient. Sweden decided to endure short-term pain for long-term gain. At 4.50 a.m. on September 3, 1967, all traffic stopped nationwide. No matter what vehicle, everything came to a halt. And then switched to the other side of the road, adopting right-side driving from then on. This day is known as, H-Day, Hoger Traffikum Lagningen. It was a rare natural experiment answering a question many had silently pondered. Would such a change be hard to get used to? Would it cause many traffic accidents? The result was quite the opposite. The number of traffic accidents and fatalities significantly decreased, and the number of car insurance claims dropped by 40%. Evidently, the unfamiliar feeling didn't cause Swedish drivers to make mistakes. Instead, it made them drive more cautiously. Interestingly, this effect lasted for two years. After which the accident rate returned to pre-change levels as people became habituated again. When you do something you're not used to, you tend to be more conscious of it and might do it better. Practice makes perfect, but being overly familiar can lead to automatic behavior, inattentiveness, and carelessness. This is what we call the comfort zone. If people always work within their comfort zone, they become complacent, losing flexibility and initiative, and becoming less alert to danger. Research shows there are several ways to dehabituate and step out of the comfort zone. One method is job rotation. For example, if assembly line workers switch positions periodically, their attention and perception of danger will increase. Another method is updating signals. Constantly sounding the same alarm will soon be ignored. So, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, proposed in 2020 that warning signals and signs must be regularly changed to maintain freshness. A more profound method of change is introducing new employees. Veteran workers may have become too complacent for voluntary change. Bringing in a batch of newcomers, especially young people, might not be as skilled, but they bring enthusiasm and fresh perspectives, sparking change. So, for a company or organization to stay dynamic, Frequent personnel changes, training, and promotion of young people are essential. Allowing veteran employees to rotate across departments and work with different people can lead to interesting new ideas. Dehabituation can enhance creativity. Even a slight change in working posture can be effective. Psychologists have various methods to test spontaneous creativity. For example, you might be given a sentence and asked to come up with an unusual word to complete it, or given an object and asked to list as many unusual uses for it as possible. These tests may not measure your hard skills but can reveal whether your brain is highly active at that moment. Experiments show that creativity, like heart rate, can fluctuate. Your creativity is related to the context. An interesting experiment involves having people work sitting down for a while, 
establishing a baseline level of creativity. Then, they are asked to stand up and walk around briefly before retesting their creativity, which shows a slight increase from the baseline. Change increases creativity. More interestingly, this boost in creativity from dehabituation lasts only six minutes. After six minutes, even if the person continues walking, their creativity drops back to baseline. What's the solution? Have them sit down again. The change from standing to sitting boosts creativity again, but only for a short period. It's not the specific posture but the change in posture that enhances creativity. Even anticipating a change can boost creativity because your mindset has already shifted. This is akin to heart rate variability. Note that these boosts in creativity are subtle. Standing up won't suddenly make you solve previously unsolvable problems, but the effect is real. For creative work, you shouldn't stay rigidly in one position. You should alternate between sitting, standing, and walking. Ideally, take breaks, change your environment, and avoid becoming habituated. You don't want to go on autopilot. You want to maintain a sense of freshness. Sharat and Sunstein tell a story familiar to many of us, but it might still feel new. In middle school, you probably practiced the scissors high jump where you cross the bar with your legs one after the other, barely using your body. This technique is not competition worthy. Today's standard high jump technique is the Fosbury flop, where you jump backward over the bar, leading with your head and back. This is a scientifically optimized posture, but it's counterintuitive. Who would think to jump like that? Before the Fosbury flop, the standard professional high jump technique was the straddle method. This involved leading with one leg and crossing the bar horizontally with your body. Almost every high jumper used this technique before 1968, except for one person. Dick Fosbury, an American high school student, invented a new jumping method. Fosbury joined his school's track team to practice high jump, initially using the straddle method. But his short stature meant he couldn't clear 1.5 meters, disqualifying him from school competitions. He began experimenting with different techniques, eventually developing the Fosbury flop. A crucial factor in the flop's success was that, his school had upgraded its high jump equipment with soft mats, allowing Fosbury to land on his back safely. This unconventional technique puzzled his coach and teammates, but by his sophomore year, Fosbury set a school record with a jump of 1.91 meters. In college, Fosbury studied engineering and used his knowledge of mechanics to refine his technique. He realized the advantage of the flop was that his body bent backward, like a bow, keeping his center of gravity below the bar, allowing him to clear higher heights. He also calculated that his takeoff point should be further from the bar compared to the straddle method. With these improvements, Fosbury won the gold medal in the high jump at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. Athletes quickly began to mimic his technique. By the Munich Olympics four years later, 28 of the 40 high jumpers used the Fosbury flop. Today, it is the standard technique. The key point of this story is that Fosbury, as an outsider, changed the mainstream approach to high jump. No matter how mature your process is, I insist on changing it. Innovators need this drive. We often say creativity is the connection of ideas. The more distant the ideas, the more interesting the connection. Innovation often happens at the margins. Sharat and Sunstein note that some of the most creative work in law over the past 50 years has come from economics. Either legal scholars have learned some economics, or economists have taken an interest in legal issues, bringing fresh perspectives to law. For example, Ronald Coase, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, developed the theory of transaction costs. At 27, he sought to answer why companies exist. Why not just have people cooperate on tasks and then disband, instead of forming companies? Before Coase, people mainly considered this question from a legal perspective, like protecting property rights. But Coase used economics to argue that companies reduce transaction costs, thus improving efficiency. Forming a company allows for a long-term contract, whereas without a company, 
people would need many short-term contracts, incurring high transaction costs. Coase solved a legal problem with economic reasoning. In turn, some of the most creative work in economics over the past 50 years has come from psychology. At least three Nobel Prizes. 2002, 2013, and 2017. Were awarded for work in behavioral economics, a field represented by Daniel Kahneman. Behavioral economics, with concepts like loss aversion, essentially challenges traditional economic assumptions of rationality with insights from psychology. Psychology has injected fresh theories into economics by challenging its rational actor model. Dehabituation essentially means seeking a balance of familiarity and surprise, a state of optimal engagement. For example, deliberate practice emphasizes avoiding habituation. While you need repetitive practice, each repetition should vary slightly, bringing new insights. Not only should practice be engaging, but even in high-level competitions, each action should not be entirely automatic. Maintaining active awareness and control during execution is crucial. It's the same in our daily interactions with others. As we mentioned earlier, even couples can become unhappy if they are too familiar with each other. It's best to keep a bit of freshness. Just like a poem says. How wonderful it would be if every time we met, we admired each other as we did the first time. But soon, why does that initial beautiful feeling change? Is it because people's hearts are fickle? Actually, it's not that the heart has changed, it's just that it has become accustomed. Dehabituation is actually very simple. You just need to take the initiative to change things up a bit and introduce some freshness, even if it's just adding a little bit of variation. Just as I write new content each time, experimenting with new formats, I never take your appreciation for granted. Each time I read your comments, I am as delighted as hearing applause for the first time on stage. If you also feel some novelty, please subscribe to me. That's it for today. In the next part, we'll talk about the Iron House Paradox. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.